Okay, so on we go uh, today. Today you got two handouts, and before I get started on the lecture, I'm going to talk about one of those handouts, which is your assignment 101. So this is your first actual assignment in this class. Uh, remember that the assignments are to be done outside of class for the most part, though you'll probably have time in and around the photography stuff to, to go through and make some post-processing while you're in the lab. But you probably need to spend a little bit of time and go out and, and take your photo. The idea here is that it should be the best possible photo that you can take. You do have to take it. You can't find an image that's online. Believe it or not, I can reverse image search images online, so I know if you took it uh, or not. But um, not that any of you guys would do that in the first place. But what I want to, to emphasize here is you take a good quality image, and then you decide which post-processing techniques are most appropriate for your particular image. So we're going to go through a bunch of stuff today. Some of the things that we do to a particular image don't change much. Other things that we do make dramatic changes. Depending on the image that you pick, what you do to the image may be very different. So Nancy, you might do two corrections, and Art, you may do five corrections. And it doesn't mean that one of you is doing a better job. It just means that your image took a few more corrections than Nancy's image did, or vice versa. And I'm picking on you guys, sorry. You get, you get picked on today. The, um, the key here is that it's your best possible photograph. So think about compositional technique. We talked about that last class. Maybe you do some cropping in Photoshop after the fact to adjust it a little bit to make it a really good image. Maybe uh, it needs a levels adjustment, and we do a levels adjustment to it. Maybe it needs some curves, et cetera. We will obviously build upon the techniques that I'm talking about. This particular assignment is due a week from today, so it's due next Wednesday. Remember that when it's assignment and it's due next Wednesday, that means it has to be posted before I start talking on Wednesday. So that's about 8.10. So you need to make sure it's already posted. If it's after that, it's going to be subject to the late penalty. So it's 10% down if you turn it in after that. There are two things. One, you're going to do a post. In that post, you're going to have your original image, and you're going to have the one that had the post-processing done to it. Obviously, the one that had the post-processing done is the better image, or it should be the better image. That's the one I'm going to grade. But you're also going to write a little paragraph that describes what it is that you did, what post-processing techniques did you use, et cetera. So it's important that you include that paragraph. If you don't include the paragraph, your grade will suffer because of it. Okay? So I'm just trying to make sure. Somehow last semester, and I'll pick on those guys for a little bit, but somehow last semester people like didn't read the assignments, and they would do things like forget to write the paragraph. Or give, I say, give me three images, and they give me one, or those kinds of things. So they got graded down because they just weren't reading it. So I'm overemphasizing it to you. Two images, your original and your uh, post-processed one. Your post-processed one is going to be the featured image. And a little paragraph that says, I did a levels adjustment, and I did a curves adjustment, or, or whatever. Okay. You're going to turn that in before class starts. You're also going to hand me a printed version of your good photo. So the post-processed one, not the original, just the, the final one. That print is just off the color laser printer across the way. So you don't have to take it to a special Photoshop. You don't have to do any kind of uh, like photo paper or anything like that. Just plain letter paper off the color laser printer is perfectly fine. Shouldn't be cropped. It should be 8.5 by 11. Stick it on the center of the page. I'm happy. Okay. I need that printed version just as a record, just in case something were to happen and your post didn't work or whatever, I still have that paper version. Okay? I'm not going to grade your papered version. It's just backup for me. Right, that, that's for you, yes. But I can't access your flash drive, so I'm not going to see it there. But that's for you. Yeah? No. So just the image, that's it. And I'll grade everything online, so I'll see the paragraph when I do the grading. Uh, there. So that's your assignment. It is due next Wednesday on the 7th. Uh, and I don't think there's anything else that's critical for you to, uh, to worry about on that one. Any questions about the assignment? Yeah? That is, is, are you looking at exercise or the assignment? So it says you can select an image that you took as part of 103, any one, 
of those. Or if you're unhappy with those images, you can take another image. So basically, it means pick any image you want. Okay. <laughs> okay? So we'll translate that. Pick any image you want, and uh, we'll go from there. Um, note, though, that you can't use a photo that you took over winter break or last summer. Or whatever. The idea is that this class started on the 22nd. The photo should have been taken from the 22nd. I'll, I'll, I'll give you back a few. So you can, you can go back to the 22nd, the Monday that we started <coughs> class. So your photo should have been taken from the 22nd on. Does that make sense? So you can't like, go way back in time and pick out your awesome photo that you took when you were ice climbing in Switzerland five years ago. Okay, That's, that's out. That's out. It, what, what that does, the reason I do that, is it evens the playing field. Everybody is here, you don't have some super subject matter, you didn't go to some awesome trip to China or whatever and have those photos. So you can't use those. Make sense? OK, so let's talk today about processing photographs. Last class, we talked about going out and taking the photographs. We talked about your camera. We talked about compositional techniques when you're out in the field shooting those photographs. Today, we're going to talk about what do you do once you get the photos and how do you make them better than the defaults. So let's keep going. So we're going to start with something called a digital workflow. And in a workflow, essentially what we're doing is we're going through a set of steps that a photographer, in this case you, typically goes through from capturing the image to doing something with the image at the end. What are the things that you generally have to do? This workflow varies by who you are and what kinds of photos you take. And it could be something as simple as, I took the photo on my phone. I looked through the couple photos that I took all at the same time. I picked the best one, and I posted that to Facebook. That's a workflow. It's a simple workflow, but it's still a workflow. If you are a wedding photographer on the other end of the spectrum, you may take that one image. You may go in, and you may retouch somebody's face. You may delete that little uh, blemish on the side. You may go through and smooth out a few things in Photoshop. It may be very involved to get that image absolutely perfect. So it's going to vary. And there's nothing wrong with it varying, depending on who you are. So typically in a workflow, you're going to begin by going out and capturing the images. Obviously, you can't have a workflow if you don't have something to work with. So you need those images to start. And then generally, the next step is take those images and get them onto your computer somehow. Maybe you have a software package. Um, if you're working on the Mac operating system, you might be using Photos. If you're working on Windows, you maybe you're a professional, you might use Lightroom, which is Adobe's product that manages your photo library. Maybe you work online, you use Google Photos. There's other options out there. But essentially, those are management applications that help you keep track of your photos and keep them organized. So you may download them in there. Maybe you just download them onto your computer onto a disk somewhere. That would work, too. So you're getting them off your phone and onto a disk. Then you're going to go through and make those general error corrections that you're, you find that you need. Is this realistic to go through? Let's say I go out, uh, I go on a family trip. And on that family trip, I take 1,000 photos. Do I go through every one and make edits? Probably not. Most of them are probably fine. But those couple key images, the really good ones, maybe I will go in. Maybe I will take them into Photoshop. Maybe I'll do a few tweaks. So it depends. Those um, corrections might be just cropping. They might be, uh, in my case, I almost always need to do a levels adjustment. So I'll do a levels adjustment or a levels call. Um, maybe you want to rotate. Maybe you want to make black and white. You can obviously get more and more extensive as you go on into masking and, and whatever, which we'll cover later on in the course. And then finally, you're going to take that finished image, and you're going to do something with it. And that do something might be put it in an album for later. It might be send it off to be printed. It might be posted to Facebook, posted to Instagram, something like that. Depends. Depends on what your intended purpose is. So that's the final output. So that's essentially your workflow. And as you get more and more comfortable with a workflow, you're going to find what things you need to do, typically. So I would ask you, do you already have one? Answer is probably yes. Maybe we're going to weave in a few more steps with Photoshop today to that workflow. What software do you plan to use? Thinking about how you're going to back up your images, make sure you don't lose those images long term. What kind of post-processing do you typically need to do? Like I said, for me, I almost always need to do a levels adjustment. So that's the one thing that I typically always go in and do to improve my images. 
Are there steps that you can automate? Photoshop has a lot of automated actions. You can write scripts for Photoshop to do things. If you repeat the same thing over and over again, you can do an automated step that will do this. And then ultimately, how are your photos typically used? What's the output going to be? When you pick software, obviously, you're going to be in the Windows ecosystem or you're going to be in the Mac e ecosystem, which is going to change. Is it going to be on the personal computer? Or are you going to do the processing on your lab computer? Do you have access to the internet? Are you going to do it on an iPad? Are you going to do it on some kind of uh, phone, tablet, etc.? Is whatever you're doing the editing in a destructive editor or a non-destructive editor? And this is actually a really big one. The non-destructive editors essentially perform the edits on layers or some variant of something like that. So what you're doing is you're making an adjustment that at any time you can elect to turn back off. If it's a destructive editor, you make an adjustment and it permanently changes the image. And you can't go back in and turn that adjustment off. Let's say in the example of I want to turn it to black and white. You take that original image, you convert it to black and white. If it's a destructive editor, you won't be able to go back to color if you decide, no, you know what, I really would rather have it be color. In a non-destructive editor, maybe you convert it to black and white, you make some other adjustments, you move on, you're going along, and you say, you know what, this is in a month, I want to go back and see that image in color, uncheck the black and white box, and there you are. You're back in color. So that's a non-destructive editor, which is obviously more valuable. Um, generally, the free ones are good up to about 10,000 images. When you move on uh, from 10,000 images, you're talking more in the professional realm, and it's generally a paid um, software at that point. Though Max Photos app is a little bit different because it can handle a lot more uh, than that. So let's talk about software options. So I'll talk about a few online ones that are available to you. If you have a Gmail account, you can use Google's Photos. Uh, very, very simple in terms of its editing. So when you're, when you're into the Photos app, essentially you're seeing your primary photo here. And then it'll give you, like you could pick here, and there's a bunch of presets. photos.google.com. Yep. And I'll have another slide that'll have that on here. And you can pick through your presets and you can kind of see over here in the presets, you know, the lighting conditions change in a variety of these. And if you pick one of these, let's say I pick this one, this image would look like that. Pretty simple. Not a lot of adjusters. There is a second little set here that has sliders. I don't have a screenshot of the sliders where you can like lighten the image a little bit or darken the image a little bit. But it's pretty broad stroke adjustments. Not not anything too fine. It's Google, photos.google.com. It's pretty easy to use. You click a button, it does it. It's pretty easy to email or download the prints. No surprise, Google wants you to be able to you know, integrate with your Gmail account. It doesn't have too many advanced editing features or filters. You need to have a connection to the internet, obviously, to use it. So you have to be at a computer that has a connection to the internet. It is a semi-destructive editor. So this is, this is kind of one of those hybrid ones. If you're in working on your photo, you can go back and you can change while you're working on it. But if you save it and download it, it becomes permanently what you, the edits you made. So it's not destructive while you're working on it, but then it becomes destructive at the end. So as long as you're still working on it, it's not a problem. You can go back and undo steps, et cetera. The next one is Photoshop Express Editor. This used to be on Photoshop.com. You could do it online, um, and it was pretty good. They took it away from the online version, and now it's just on your iOS or Android device, so it's, it's basically for working in your tablet. Same kind of thing, where you have deliberate uh, choices to make. They show you a little preview across the bottom, and you can make those adjustments. There are a few little sliders. There's a few more features than are based in the Google uh, Photos app, so it's a little bit better. It's available via Adobe, who's the maker of Photoshop in the first place. Um, it's pretty easy to use. The presets are pretty easy. Click on it. It makes the adjustments. Um, again, it's easy to email it or download it if you want to. It has a few more advanced features. You can do a little bit more with it. You also have to have a connection to the internet. And this one is a destructive editor. So when you're done, it's, it's finished. So it's best to work on a copy of your file if you're working on it. Uh, and obviously, you have to have a phone or a tablet to do it. Pixlr.com is another example here. And if you look at Pixlr, 
once it loads up, it does require Flash to load. It looks almost exactly the same as Photoshop when you open it up. It's pretty awesome. It has almost all the features of Photoshop built into it, and it's free. So it's not a bad thing. Shockingly Photoshop-like, save back to your flash drive just as you would if you were working in Photoshop. It does, of course, require an internet connection. It also requires flash to be on your computer. It has fairly advanced editing features, but it does not have adjustment layers. Yeah. Do they have an app now, too? Yeah. OK, I need to update my slide then. So another uh, app, if you're using your, your iPad or whatever, it's really it's a good, good option, certainly for free, if you don't want to pay for Photoshop or the subscription to it. Uh, but the, the big thing there is no adjustment layers. So you're making an adjustment directly to the image as opposed to applying the adjustment to a layer, which you can then mask. So anyway, we'll go through what adjustment layers are a little bit later today. It is ultimately a destructive editor and requires Flash. So if you're working in the Apple ecosystem, uh, Apple used to have two products. They had iPhoto and they had Aperture. Aperture was their professional version of, of iPhoto. Aperture was awesome. I loved it, and I worked with it for years. And then Apple said, nope, we're not going to do it anymore. And they also said, nope, we're not going to do iPhoto anymore. And we're going to introduce just one app that's supposed to work for professional people and non-professional people, and it's going to be called Photos. So this is what, what they came up with. Is it as good as what Aperture was? Personally, I don't think so. I really liked what Aperture used to do. Um, the only alternative for that now is Lightroom. But it's OK. And it still has fairly decent editing features. It's free if you have a Mac. So that's nice. If you live in the Apple ecosystem, using their products is not, not a bad thing. Uh, it's non-destructive editing, so you can always go back and turn off a, a correction that you made or an adjustment that you made, which is great. It helps you organize your files as well. So it's file organization in addition to editing. So you can store your, file, your photos in iCloud or, or whatever. Um, it does have a lot of advanced editing features. You can do curves, histograms, uh, levels adjustments, et cetera. They do have selective dodging burning. They have healing if you want to get rid of something, which is kind of like a clone stamp. And it has extensive metadata support. So it knows what the GPS location when you took the photo with your phone. It knows where it was taken, those kinds of things. Uh, facial recognition, so it can recognize who's in the photos, all that sort of thing. Um, it is, of course, Mac only. And it re doesn't require, but it tries to get you to buy the iCloud subscription. So you're kind of on the hook for that, too. Then we move into professional options. Like I said, we used to have Aperture, which I really liked. It was a great product, but Apple got rid of it. So the only real player in the professional realm is something called Lightroom, which is a lot. It's made by Adobe. It looks a lot like Photoshop. The difference here is that Lightroom is about organizing your, f your files and doing basic level edits. Because it's Adobe, and because Photoshop is also Adobe, Lightroom plays really well with Photoshop. So there's no surprise that they integrate. And you can do the more advanced editing in Photoshop. But you can see up there already that there's a curves adjustment. There's a histogram. Uh, a lot of the, the complex editing stuff is still baked into something like this. But it, it encourages you uh, in your file organizational system to keep track of your photos and uh, ultimately to control where the backups occur and that sort of thing. It is, however, expensive. You can get it included in your Creative Cloud subscription. But you guys know that Creative Cloud can get rather expensive per month, depending on how many things you start to tack on to it. Um, it is non-destructive editing of images, so you can turn off or on any of those corrections along the way. Yeah? Did you say this is Lightroom was for Windows and for Mac? Yes, it's for both, okay. Windows and Mac. But it's the kind of professional grade option from Adobe. Uh, extremely advanced editing features, including histograms, curves, and all that sort of thing built in, so you don't actually have to go into Photoshop unless you need to. Extensive metadata support uh, and all the, the typical file organizational systems. And the last one that we'll talk about is Photoshop itself. And so this class is about the Creative Suite. That's one of the big software packages that we talk about. So no surprise, we're going to spend our time in this class talking about Photoshop and working in Photoshop. And so the thing about Photoshop is it's not meant to organize your files. It's not meant to keep track of where your files are and make albums or anything like that. It's about coming in and fixing one image at a time. And so for that, it's the best thing out there. So just don't think it's going to do your organization for you. Um, 
It has all the most advanced editing features. You can get down to pixel by pixel correction of color if you want to. And we're going to go through a lot of these options. Uh, your work is generally stored on layers. The layers can be combined through blending modes. There's a lot of flexibility that's, that's built into it for you. Pixel level correction, um, but again, no organization built into it. So obviously, we're going to cover that extensively in this class, not the other options. Organizing your images. I'm going to talk a little bit about this. I'm not going to spend too much time on it. But one of the key concepts in digital photos is there's something called metadata, or extra information that's stored in every digital photograph that you take. And in the, in the old days, when you, and maybe you had like a, an aunt that used to take these pictures, right? She would take the pictures, and you'd get them back, and it had like a little orange date in the corner. Maybe a few of you are nodding, right? The, my aunt loved to do that, so I'm picking on her today. So there's that little orange date in the corner. Well, when we take a digital photo, oh, there isn't that little orange date in the corner, but that information is stored in the file itself. It's not something you can see. It's invisible, but it's stored with the file. And so if we were looking at metadata, and I'm going to look right here. This is an example of some metadata uh, of, a, of a photo. I don't even know what photo it was that I took. It stores a bunch of information. Obviously, I said that the date would be there. So there's the date. And it's you know, the exact time that I took it. We've got size, what the pixel size is, what the megabytes were, et cetera. We also have a bunch of other information up here at the top. So it was shot with my Nikon D80. I had the 18 to uh, 135 millimeter zoom lens on. The ISO we talked about last class was set to 125. The lens was set to 62 millimeters when I took the shot. My exposure value was set to 0. My aperture was 5.6. And my shutter speed was 1 500th of a second. So all of that information was stored in with the file. So it's good information to have. Furthermore, with these kinds of, oh, you can also see right here it was set with raw. So it was a raw image when I shot it. So when you start to look at this, we can sort our images based on this kind of information. Show me all the images that were shot with an aperture of 1.8. I want to see just those images. So it's all extra information that's included. The other thing down here doesn't work with my Nikon D80, obviously, because it's an older camera. But let's say you shoot with your phone. Your phone has GPS in it. And you guys remember when you first open up your phone when it's new, the thing flashes up saying, do you want to allow your camera to have access to location services? And everybody says, yeah, sure, whatever, click yes. Well, what that's saying is, when you take a photo, can I put the GPS location of where you took the photo stored in the metadata with the photo? And so now most photos actually have GPS location included with them. And obviously, that would help us organize. This so, is a phone, right? so you, you buy a regular camera, they probably don't. Most have regular cameras don't have it. Some do, but most don't. Your phones obviously have it built in. Um, iPads are a little bit iffy, you know, tablets, because depending on if they're cellular or not, depending on if they're connected to Wi Fi or not, it may give you an approximate location, not an exact location. Cell phone, it knows, you know, it's got GPS running, it knows exactly where you are when it takes it. So when we get into organizing your, your photos, and again, this is not Photoshop. This is using some other software package to do it. Um, there's a variety of ways that you can organize your, your photos. The simplest way would be in albums, which are essentially, hey, here's all my pictures from my vacation to Hawaii, or here's all my pictures from my son's birthday, or whatever. Okay? It's a manual thing. We'll put everything in there. There are smart albums that try to collect things that are certain times together. We move on into something called events. This was something that Apple kind of came up with, and everybody followed suit with it. The idea here is that typically you don't shoot one photo every 30 seconds over the course of years. You shoot a group of photos. You shoot maybe 150 photos. And then you don't take any photos for a couple days. And then you go shoot some more photos. So Apple said, well, wait a minute. If you shot that group of photos, chances are they all go together, because you probably shot them at a birthday party or something. and then." You take another group of photos some other time. So they've, they've gotten smart enough to understand that these are events that happen. And typically, you can group your photos by events. And it usually does it automatically, which is nice. Faces. Um, most, Photoshop, uh, most photo software that runs on a computer can recognize faces. And you guys have probably encountered this before. Um, maybe, maybe not through a photo management application, but maybe through your, uh, your Facebook account or something like that. Essentially, facial recognition is at the point where you can look at a series of photos, and your computer can determine who's in the photos. 
and it can group by who's in particular photos. So show me all the photos of me. Maybe it takes one photo where you say, this is me, and then it'll learn from there. It's not perfect, but it's pretty good. Geolocation, so this is places. You shot a, a particular photo in a geographic location. It got stamped to your GPS. You can search by where to show me all the pictures I took in Rome that I took on my cell phone because it had GPS tied to it, for example. So let's move into the typical adjustments. I moved through that organization stuff rather fast because it's, it's specific to your per personal organizational strategy and what you're doing on your own computer. But I at least like to bring it up. So let's talk about typical adjustments that are done. So first off, we can do a crop or a resize to a particular image. So let's say I shot my image. It was in portrait mode. I didn't really do a good job of making it follow the rule of thirds. Maybe I want to come in after the fact, and I want to crop that image down to make it look a little bit better to, to, to adjust the composition of it. Um, remember the principles from last semester or from last class about our compositional techniques? How are we going to lay out these images? And remember, you also can't crop something to be larger. So if you take it big, you can make it small, but you can't take something small and make it big. It should be obvious, but I want to remind you of that. Okay? So make sure that you're cropping down, not up. And obviously, you have to have the resolution to be able to blow that image up and not have it blurry or, or to be able to print it in the ultimate size that you want it to be. Another example here of cropping after the fact. So you can see that the, in this instance of the original photo, the person was centered didn't follow the rule of thirds at all. You do the crop, and now she's on the rule of thirds. Changes pretty dramatically what that composition looks like. Another example here. I talk about the rule of thirds. We did the rule of thirds last class. Everything I showed you was a rectangle. Rule of thirds still applies to a square. So you're doing that square photo on Instagram. You can do the same rule of thirds. You will find in Photoshop when we do these things, Photoshop automatically includes the grid lines for the rule of, of thirds when you do a crop. Another example of the rule of thirds cropping down for that, I would absolutely love to work here. This looks awesome to me. So I had to include that image. I don't know where it, where it even came from. But to me, this is like, yes, sign me up. I'll sit there and draw. Exposure. So let's say you, you improperly exposed your original image, or your camera didn't calculate the exposure correctly, and it was too dark, and you wanted to make it a little bit lighter. You can adjust that exposure. If you shot in RAW, you have a much better chance of having good adjustment here. If you sh didn't shoot in RAW, if you have a JPEG, you can generally lighten a dark image, but you can't darken a light image. So it works better in the dark to light direction. If you shot in RAW, you can do both. You can adjust that exposure value after the fact. Um, so let's show an example. So you have the image on the left, the original image. It's too dark. It's, it's, it's muddled. Then you do a post-processing. After the fact, you lighten that up. And so you get the, the, the dog with the correct um, exposure. Brightness and color. Yeah? When you take the regular camera, like mm -hmm. decent ones, though, when mm -hmm. you take it, you didn't fit. I didn't know what raw is before, right? Mm -hmm. So when I take, so what is it? Is it raw or is it not raw? Uh, we'd have to look at the camera to see. Uh, it depends. A lot of cameras now are starting to just default to RAW. Um, in, you know, go back five years, and memory cards were expensive and not very much size. So a lot of cameras said, no, we'll just do a high quality JPEG out. Now memory cards are cheap. So frequently, cameras just default to all shoot in RAW. Can you tell by the, uh, the size? Like, is it 10 megabytes? It, 10 megabyte is probably a RAW image. But we can look specifically uh, at the file extensions. Brightness and contrast, this is kind of a, a broad stroke adjustment. And it's not something that's used that much. But essentially, you can adjust the overall brightness of the image or the dark and light contrast. So dark in the darks, light in the lights to create a little bit more uh, contrast. It is a really broad stroke tool. It's much better to do a levels or a curves adjustment than to do a brightness and contrast adjustment. But you can see it does work. So we've got the image of the grass on the left. We've done some uh, contrast adjustment, and suddenly the image on the right is what we get. Color, saturation, and vibrance. So three other adjustments here. We talked about last class when we had a bad white balance, and it was that blue image compared to what it should have been. Um, this is where you can basically adjust that. You can adjust the color tone of the particular image. Uh, you can also add saturation or vibrance, which is color. 
to an image to enhance it. Let me show you an example of saturation and vibrance. We've got two images here. The left image is a saturation adjustment. So when we saturate the colors, we get more of specific colors. We get more green, more blue, but we also get more skin tone. So it looks like this guy went to the spray tanning booth. Okay. On the other hand, we have vibrance next door. And vibrance is picking certain colors and bumping the values of certain colors. And I'm going to show you guys how to do this using a, a tutorial that I call Pop. Uh, that is essentially doing the same kind of thing, where we're pulling out certain colors, but we're trying not to accentuate skin tones, for example. So there's subtle differences, and we can play around with those options as you go forward. Maybe you want to convert an image to black and white or sepia tone. Sepia tone is that brownish. It's that old black and white tone. Um, you could do that, certainly. And I'll show you guys how to do that today. Color image to black and white. Focus. So this is kind of an interesting one. You can in improve small bits of contrast or focus to an image, but you can't take a blurry image and suddenly make it in focus. So I think this is one of those misnomers where you see it in Photoshop and you say, oh, great, I have a blurry image. It didn't turn out well. I'll go into focus and I'll, I'll, make, it, I'll make it perfect again. Well, it doesn't work that way. It's very small adjustment. It's like, let me see the edges stand out just a little bit more. Let me sharpen those up just a little bit. So here's an example. It's really hard to see the difference. On the left is the original image. On the right is the one that has a little bit of sharpening applied to it or a little bit of focus applied to it. If you look carefully at the pages, you can see just a little bit more contrast on the edges of the pages. They stand out just a little bit more than they do on the left image. So they're subtle. So look, look right there versus right here. The page is a little bit more defined. I don't have a fine enough little marker to see. The, the edges of the pages are a little bit more defined here than they are back over here. They're a little bit more blurry here. It's a subtle adjustment. Typically, if you're doing it on a computer, you can probably see a little bit more difference than I can show you on a projector. Projectors are never perfect. Red eye reduction. You guys have experienced red eye before. I'm sure you've seen this in images. Anybody know why red eye happens? The reflection in the back of your eye. Exactly. OK, so let, let, let's explain it, and then it'll make more sense. OK? So you're, right, you're on the right track. So we're in a dark room. What do our, what do our irises do to accommodate the dark room? They get really big, just like the aperture on a camera. Let more light in, so they get really big. So then somebody says, great, I'm going to take a picture of all these people. And it's a dark room, so I pull out my camera. And obviously, my camera needs to flash. So I'm going to stand there. All of you are ready. And I'm going to hold up my camera, and I'm going to take a picture. Boom, bright flash. That flash goes right in through that big, wide open iris in your eye, bounces off the back of your eye, and comes out. And that red light that comes back out gets captured, and you get red eye. So camera makers got smart, and they said, OK, well, instead of just having that one big flash, we're going to strobe the flash a few times before we actually take the image thereby reducing the size of your iris so we don't let as much light in. So even though you can't see anymore after somebody's done that, you theoretically get less red eye out of that. Obviously, we could, we could go in and we could make this correction in Photoshop piece of cake. But the reason that we do those little strobes ahead of time, or better yet, the, um, let's say you're in a wedding and you, you, you've seen, and I pick on wedding photographers because they're the ones that carry the big cameras with big flashes. So, you're, you're in that, and the wedding photographer is taking pictures. You notice that there's a camera, and then there's the flash kind of mounted off to the side, or it's bounced off the side, or it's way over here. The further apart the lens and the flash are, the less likely the light is going to enter your eye and bounce back out. So the closer together, i.e. your cell phone, where the flash and the lens are right next to each other, when you flash, it's going to come right back at the camera. But if you separate those, it's not going to come back because it's off to the side. So that's part of why they shoot with those big flashes on the sides. Anyway, something certainly we could correct after the fact in Photoshop without a problem. OK, so let's get into more of the fun ones. These are the ones that can really make a difference that you probably don't know about yet, but you will after today. First one is levels. And I told you before that I typically need to do a levels adjustment on most of my images. And so this is a levels adjustment. I'm going to come back to this slide. I'm going to jump one slide ahead, and we'll come back and talk about it, because I want to show you the actual photograph example before we get into what this chart means. So here we have two images, same image. The first one right here, 
right? So image one. Image one doesn't have a levels adjustment done to it yet. And image two right here does have the levels adjustment. So in image one, if we looked at what is really black in this image, we could say, OK, well, maybe like this shadow right in here is black. Okay, but it's really more of a dark gray. It's not really black. And if I looked at this image and I said, well, okay, well, what's white in this image? Well, white is maybe maybe like this little piece of peeling paint there, or maybe maybe this little piece of peeling paint there. That might be the white. But is it really white? No, it's kind of a medium gray. So what a levels adjustment does is it said says instead of having white be medium gray and black be dark gray. It says, no, this point in the image right there, that's the dark point that should be black, is going to be true black. So it redistributes the colors so that black is there and true white is now right there. So you can see in the contrast that this makes a big difference to the overall image. So we see this happen. And this, you know, I'm up here and I'm talking about it. As soon as you do it on one of your images, it'll start to make sense. So we're going to actually do it together. Uh, in a little bit. But if I go back to the slide itself, this one here, this chart right here is called a histogram. And it represents the distribution of pixels from black to white in your image. So if you imagined your image in grayscale or in black and white, this little graph that goes up like this and back down, this graph represents the distribution or the number. If you were to count individual pixels in your image, how many are this color gray? How many are a little bit darker? How many are a little bit darker? And it graphs them. So you'd have a bunch of graph lines coming up. Obviously, somewhere right in here is that big, high spike. Most everything is about that medium gray. If we take and we say, in this, in this particular instance, this is black, this right here is black, and this right here is white, if we say that, you know what? my graph doesn't have any pixels from right here all the way to out here. There's nothing. I don't have anything. So let me take white, and I'm going to pull it back until it hits where my graph starts. So I'm adjusting where that white point is. I'm going to do the same thing with the black point. There's not really any black until right about here. So I take this black point, and I pull it over until my graph starts. So I'm redistributing the pixels. I'm saying this is now black, this is now white. So we'll do this live, and it'll make more sense. But I at least try to explain it. It will stretch out the histogram, exactly. And you'll see it happen. OK, so let's move on to the next one, curves. Um, yeah? So is it fair to say level is the same as make more contrast? In a it's a better way of adjusting contrast. If you adjust true contrast, it's too broad. Levels is specific, because you're stretching certain parts of it, but keeping the middle the same. Curves is almost impossible to explain in lecture. You kind of just have to do it to explain it. But I'm going to try for right now. But if it goes over your head, it's OK. We'll explain it when you're actually working on an image. Um, es essentially, what we're doing is we're selectively adjusting certain parts of an image. So if I look over here, I have an image on the left that doesn't have a curves adjustment. I have an image on the right that does have a curves adjustment. And you guys can see, oh, something is definitely different in the image on the right than it is on the left. But it's a little bit harder to pick out. Because it's not that contrast adjustment. It's not as levels adjustment. We're individually going in and adjusting certain parts of the image. So the dark part of the image up at the top that's the background that's kind of blurry, we've lightened that part up. We've, we've adjusted the shadows just a little bit to bring a little bit more out of the shadows. But we haven't touched the lighter part of the image. So it's this weird kind of. You do a little bit to certain parts of the image. And this is why it's hard to explain in, in a verbal context until you have an image that you're doing it on, and then you can see it happen. Another example here of the curves adjustment, where we have the image on the left. It's not a bad image. We do a curves adjustment on it, and it becomes slightly better. So it's a smaller scale adjustment, but I'll walk through it with you. Finally, we get to that output phase. So we've done our Photoshop adjustments on the particular image. We're going to put it out to Facebook. We're going to put it out to Instagram. Or we're just going to save it on our computer for some later day in a big file of photos. But there is some output, ultimately, to it. Maybe we're putting on a web gallery, uh, in which case we can share that web gallery with somebody so that they could look at the photos as well. OK? 
Okay? So I'm going to stop with the lecture part, and we're going to go in to do some actual examples. But before I, I jump over there, and we'll take a little break in between um, to get you set up. Usually I wait until after the demo to do the break, but I think today it's better if you follow along for the first set. So we'll take our break first, and then we'll, we'll get back and, and do this. But what I want you to do is I want you to read that first part of exercise 104, where I say we're going to work with three images today. So you're going to pick three images of the ones that you shot last class. You pick three that you think are good. Those images, wait, those images we'll then work with. And what we're going to do with those images is we're going to start with the first one, and we're going to do a bunch of different adjustments to it. And you may find that the levels adjustment doesn't do anything to the first image. And sometimes that's the case. Then you move on to the second image, and you say, oh, wow, the levels adjustment does a ton, but the curves adjustment didn't do anything to it. So depending on the image, these are going to work or not work. But we're going to go through each um, adjustment on every image. So you're going to end up with 18 total images today with these adjustments applied to it. And all of that is, is about the practice. So the first one will run together. So if while we're taking our break, uh, we'll come back at 9.05 to start up again. If while we're taking the break, you could find that first image and get it onto your computer, that would be helpful because then you can follow along with me as we go through it. OK? You said get it onto the computer. Get it onto the computer. From the flash drive. From your flash drive or your camera drive or, or whatever it is. Oh, if you were being specific about flash drive to computer, no. Just okay. off your camera and onto your flash drive or some place that we can actually manipulate it on the computer. I don't want you sitting there saying, wait, I have to get it from my phone to the computer. Do that now you know, and, and get it there so we can actually work with it. We can still manipulate it if it's on the flash drive. Absolutely. Absolutely. But it needs to be on your flash drive, not the like SD card from your camera. Get it on the flash drive itself. Yes. OK, I'll help you with that. Are there any other big questions first? No? OK, I'll see you back at 9.05. Enough time today for coffee. OK, so we're going to start up with our exercise 104. And this is where we're going to go through kind of step by step uh, through the, the post-processing process um, in Photoshop. Like I said, I want you guys to all pick an image, and you can kind of follow along with me as I go through the steps. And then you're going to do this twice more uh, with two other images. And remember, not every time does it work perfectly. So it's OK. But uh, it's all about the learning process. So I've picked uh, actually a variety of images to start uh, for me so that I can try to illustrate what's working and what's not working. So for me personally, I'll be jumping between images to try to show you what's happening. But for you guys, stick with one image for the first round, and then you can go back and do another image uh, in the second round. And so what we'll start with uh, is following, and I have each of these written out as their own tutorial. So if you get lost or something, you can always reference those. We're going to start with the first one, which is converting an image to black and white. It's Photoshop 1.1. If you have the book, it's easier because it's in front of you. But you can look um, online. If you go to the tutorial section, you go to Photoshop. Photoshop 1.1 black and white is what we're going to do. But we're going to go through all of these down to 1.6 today. So we'll start with 1.1. And if I was actually on 1.1 and logged in, which I am here, uh, you'll see that there's actually a demo video that talks about exactly what I'm going to go through. So. If you get a little bit lost, you can go back and see that. If down the road you wanted to convert to black and white and you forgot, it's there. Below that is the actual steps that I'm going to go through so that you guys can see all of those uh, written out. So I just want to point out that they're there in addition to what I'm talking about as we, as we go through. So the first thing, we'll start with black and white because black and white is kind of a big, you can see it happen as we go through it. Um, and essentially, what we're going to do in Photoshop, but before, well, before I even get to that, I should walk through Photoshop in general. What's happening in Photoshop? What do we see? Uh, what's the, the interface look like? I forget this is the first time you guys potentially have ever opened Photoshop. So let's talk about it. Um, this looks a lot like most Adobe products when you open it. They have kind of a similar setup, a similar look. Across the top here, we have a series of menu items that, that access certain commands should we need to. Below these menu items is a contextual ribbon that changes based on what tool you have selected. So for example, I have the rectangular marquee selected right now, so I get tools that are about the selection process. If I were to switch down to clone stamp, for example, my 
contextual toolbar ribbon here changes to be tools about or options for the clone stamp tool. If I came down to uh, the dodging and burning tools, I'm going to have a different set of options show up. So this ribbon is always going to change based on what tool you have active. Uh, so that's where you want to be looking for your options. Down the left side here, we have a variety of tools that are available, most of which we won't use today. We'll use a little bit of the dodging and burning tools, but not too much uh, tool processing here because we're going to be doing broader stroke adjustments to our images. Um, let's see. Obviously, in the middle of the screen is my image. If you don't have an image already shown, you can go to the File menu and say Open, and you should be able to open it. Uh, there's a few people that have raw images that these computers haven't been updated to accept. If you're in one of those categories, I can help you with the raw images um, to, to get those viewable in Photoshop. On the right side over here, um, you'll see that there's a little drop-down menu up here in the, the very top. And this drop-down menu allows us to change the general workspace. So if we're in Essentials, for example, it's going to adjust which um, windows are, are open to us on the side. If we went down, today we're going to be working in photography, we can change to photography, and it's going to show us the photography tools. So it's trying to help us by putting the tools and the windows um, easier, e more accessible um, when we're working on something specific. So today I'm going to work with the photo photography um, workspace showing. Below that, um, we, we look here in our windows. The first one is, is the histogram window. We talked about this graph a little bit in the levels adjustment. And I'll come back to it when we do our actual levels adjustment. Below that, we have the ability to click buttons for various adjustments. I'm going to access these not by the buttons, but instead by the adjustment layers through the menu structure. I think it's a little bit clearer in terms of what you're picking. These pictures don't always reflect exactly what you're doing with them. <laughs> Uh, below that, we have something called the Layers palette. And in the Layers, as we create adjustments, they're going to show up here in the Layers palette. We have, by default, just a background layer. This background layer contains my image and is locked. So I can't make adjustments directly to this, this um, image. And that's good for today. We don't need to make adjustments directly to the image. We'll get to the point where we do do adjustments directly on the image. But for right now, nothing we need to do. Um, there's a few little other little options down at the bottom here, like adding a, a mask uh, or adding a folder to control your, your layers. Those kinds of things are available to you, but we're not going to cover those just yet. So we're starting with simple, but it's, it's nice to at least walk through what the interface looks like before we get started. So now I'm going to start with Photoshop 1.1, converting the image to black and white. And all of the adjustments that we're going to be working with Rather than applying them directly to the image, we're going to be applying them to something called an adjustment layer, which essentially means the adjustment is applied on a separate layer that we can then turn on and turn off whenever we want to. And you'll see as we go through that it's pretty easy to work with. So I'm going to go up to the Layer menu at the top. And I'll come down to New Adjustment Layer. And this is where all of my adjustment layers are listed. And so the one that we're going to work with, shockingly enough, is not called black and white. It's actually called the channel mixer. And it's, it's interesting because there's a subtle difference between the two. And they still include the black and white, but you get far less control with the black and white as to what the final image is going to look like than you do with the channel mixer. So I'm going to work with the channel mixer instead. So I'll click New Adjustment Layer and Channel Mixer. And when I click on that, I get this little new layer pop-up that comes up. And it allows me to name the layer. So in this case, Channel Mixer 1 is a perfectly acceptable name. We could instead change it to black and white, if that's clearer for you, long term. Doesn't matter. It's, this is a name for you. It's not going to affect anything uh, long term. The rest of the options here are just fine. I'll go ahead and say OK. On the right side here, under Layers, you'll see that where we used to have just the background layer, we now have something called black and white. We have this little kind of three circle icon and a white square. That represents the adjustment that we're about to apply. This white square will also make a lot more sense. It's a layer mask, but we're not covering that just yet. We'll get to that. 
So at the same time, the channel mixer properties window will show up. It automatically pops up right here. And in this channel mixer properties window, we can adjust the colors, but there's also a checkbox for something called monochrome. So if I check the box for monochrome, you'll see that instantly my image turns to black and white. So I've gotten the effect of black and white. But there's a step more here, and that is that right here under something called preset, there's a bunch of presets that are default loaded in from Photoshop. And it's black and white with an infrared, black and white with a blue filter, green filter, orange filter, red filter, and yellow filter. So this is designed to mimic if you are a professional photographer and you went out and shot with your camera in black and white, you might put a color tinted lens on top of your existing lens, a filter. We'd screw it in and shoot through that to get a certain effect. So if you were an Ansel Adams or somebody who's a really good photographer who shot in black and white, you would understand what these filters do to the environment. For me personally, I'm not that good. So what I do is I come up here and I go through all six of these and I decide which one looks best on my image. Really easy to do after the fact in Photoshop. So after we've checked the box for monochrome, we're gonna go to preset and we're gonna go to black and white infrared and take a look at the image. Okay, let's go down to the next one, black and white with a blue filter. And you can see each time I do it, the image dramatically changes. So we'll go down here, black and white, whoops, let me go to the green filter first, all right. How about black and white with the orange filter? Hmm, I kind of like that one. Let me come down here to black and white with a red filter, a little bit darker sky. Let's try the last one, black and white with the yellow filter. Okay, so I think the one that feels best to me is probably the orange or the red filter. I think I like the orange. Well, maybe the red is okay. So I've gone through and I've decided this is the, the version of black and white that I like, as opposed to just saying convert to black and white. So using this, this preset, I'm allowing the image to look different. Does that kind of make sense? So it gives us a lot more flexibility. Now, each time I change the preset, you'll see that my channels down here, the red, the green, and the blue channel, actually adjust. And as they adjust, Nancy, if you want to sit in that seat over there, there's nobody in that one. Or you can take, I don't know if he's done. Are you done with that? This one? Oh, yeah, yeah, you, can. you can sit right there. So these channels will change each time. So in this case, with the red filter, I've got my red at 100% and zero and zero. If I were to switch, for example, to the blue filter, my blue would go to 100% and zero and zero. I could manually adjust these numbers if I wanted to. So the orange filter would be somewhere. So there we go. Orange filter, we've got green at 100%. Go figure. Okay. The point is that we could manually adjust these if you wanted to. Um, I think the presets work nicely, and if you go through them, chances are you're going to find one that, that looks pretty good for your individual image. So once this is done, I can minimize this properties window using this little sideways double arrow, and it'll go back. And now I have a black and white version of my photo. The good news is this was a non-destructive edit, so I can come over to my layer stack right here, and I can turn off the black and white layer, and I get right back to my color version. I can turn it back on, or I can turn it off, depending on what I'm doing. So for this first piece, now that we've converted, uh, now that we've, we've made this black and white uh, adjustment, actually, I'm gonna go through the adjustments and then I'll do the saves at the end. So I have black and white. Now I wanna move on and do the next adjustment. The next adjustment that we're going to do is the levels adjustment. And so I'll go up to my layer, I'll go to New Adjustment Layer, and this time I'm going to pick Levels. It is what it, what it says this time. So we'll pick Levels. Calling it Levels 1 is just fine. And you'll see that the little properties that pops up is now the Levels properties. So in this case, as I look at my graph here, I actually have a distribution of pixels from black all the way to white. If I were to look at this particular image, there's some pieces like this branch here that that's pretty much black. And if I look at the white, the cloud, for example, here is pretty much pure white. So there's not a lot of levels adjustment that I can even do to this particular image. So in this case, a levels adjustment isn't going to help this image much. So I'm going to move on 
to a different image so that you guys can see a levels adjustment that would actually do something. So here's another image. I'm going to go to layer, new adjustment layer, levels. And in this image, my black, see how the, it's the graph here, the histogram is flat to right at that point. I'm going to pull this black point over until it lines up with where that graph starts to go up. Now, if I pulled it over too far, the image would get too dark. But I'm just pulling it over to where that graph starts to come up. And you can see that it makes a dramatic in difference to the image. Now, in this case, there's not too much to do with the white. Maybe I could pull it over just a bit. But in this image, I already have pretty white clouds. So I have a, a kind of a pure white. So in this image, it's not too much adjustment, but it is still there. Let me move on to another image. Just to, I'm flipping through images just so that you guys can see this levels adjustment happen. I'm going to go once again to Layer, New Adjustment Layer, and Levels. And there we go. This time I have nice black right there, but I don't. the white isn't quite set right, so I'll pull the white over a little bit more. I should find an example that has a more dramatic swing. Let me try. I've done that one. I've done that one. I've done that one. How about this one? Oh, this one will work. Once again, uh, layer, new adjustment layer, levels. There we go. This one's a little bit more extreme. So there's my, my histogram. The black point, I'm going to pull this triangle over to be right there. And the white point, I'm going to pull it back to be right about there. The sun is already fairly white, so I'm not going to gain too much by pulling it back. But I'm going to pull it back to about there. And you can see that there's a difference in that image as well. So there it is without, there it is with. And that's the good news about doing these adjustments on a layer, is we can toggle it on and off depending on how, if we like it or if we don't like it. That one's not too much different. And we'll come back to my original image here, which really didn't do anything. There is a midpoint in the levels adjustment. And if you want to skew the overall image to be slightly darker or slightly lighter, you can adjust that middle triangle and it will over do an adjustment on the overall image. So if you wanted it to be just a little bit lighter or a little bit darker, you could do it. But that's the whole image. It's kind of like the big stroke versus the smaller strokes. So I like to at least point out that it's there. OK, so now I have my levels adjustment done. I'm going to move on and do a curves adjustment next. So I'll go up to Layer. I'll go to New Adjustment Layer, and I'll pick Curves this time. So we did Levels first. Now we're doing Curves. And we can leave it called Curves 1. I'll go ahead and say OK. And this one is a really complicated graph to try to understand what's happening. <coughs> and so in a curves graph, we see the histogram as part of our, of, as part of our, uh, our curves graph here. But we also see a point down here at black and a straight line that goes up on a diagonal and reaches this end, which is pure white. So it's a little bit like having your histogram turned at a 45 degree angle. And so essentially, what we're doing is we can control individual parts of the image separate from each other. So what I'll do is I'll set a point right here in the center of my graph. And when I click, you'll see that it'll set one point for me. I can then take this upper part, and about halfway up the upper part, I can drag this toward the top. This makes a curve that looks slightly like an S, an elongated S. And you can see that when I do this, this is a typical S curve. We have the image original, and we make the adjustment to it, and it lightens the light areas of the image and darkens up the dark and darker areas of the image. Generally speaking, the lower half of this curve is the darker section. The upper half of this curve is the lighter section. So let me try that again on a different image, see if we can get some other results here. Let me go to Layer, New Adjustment Layer, Curves. There it is. I'll set my point in the center. I can pull this up. Or I can push it down, and you guys can see how it changes this particular image. So typical S-curve, something like that, feels about right. Now notice, 
once I have this S curve, I can still make adjustments. So if I wanted this lower section to be more flat, I can flatten it out. If you get too extreme, you get really whacked out results. So you want to stay close. So maybe something about like that. If I wanted it to be a little bit darker, I could push it down. Obviously, that's getting more saturated. So somewhere about there. might be about right. So there was the original image. There's the new image. So it's pushing the colors a little bit more in this particular context. This image here, and like I said, I'm flipping through images just so you can see me do it multiple times. You're going to do one image, go through everything. Even if it doesn't apply, try it. So we'll go to Layer, New Adjustment Layer, Curves. I'll set my point right here in the center, and I'll work the S just a little bit. And you can see that the sky actually, this one makes a pretty good impact to the sky. There it is before, there it is after. It punches out the sky a lot. Now, one of the things that we'll, we'll also talk about with, with the curves tool is sometimes curves works best if you have control over various parts of the image. So you might make a curves adjustment and want to affect just the sky but not the ground. We can do that with a layer mask. And we'll talk about that in the layer mask section. So we'll come back to curves. So if curves are a little bit difficult at this point, that's OK. Um, we, can, we can go through it. Do, do play around with it, though, because you may find that some of these uh, really help your image. So once again, layer, new adjustment layer, curves. This time, maybe I'll just do the image as a whole. Maybe I'll drag it up a little bit, which is going to lighten the overall image just a bit, about like that. So instead of the S curve this time, I did a more traditional bowing curve. Either way. And you want to play around with it, see what, what fits your particular image best. OK, so I've gone through the curves adjustment next. Now, I can also turn all of these on and off depending on, remember, the, which layer is on or which layer is off. So the next one is going to be the pop tutorial. And this one works best for things like sunsets where we have deep colors. Blues and reds are, are really good for this. I'm going to open another image. I think I have a sunset image to maybe show this a little bit better. So here's a sunset image. And I want to do this pop tutorial. And again, all of these are written out. So you can go back and, and cross-reference what I'm saying. For the pop tutorial, I'm going to go up to my uh, layer, new adjustment layer. And once again, I'll pick my channel mixer just like we did with black and white. But this time, we're going to be adjusting color. So I'll go to Channel Mixer, and I'll say OK. And instead of checking the box for monochrome, I'm going to start to actually adjust these colors. So we'll start by selecting just the red channel right here. So there's my red channel. And I'm going to adjust the red value to be 116. Oops, 116. No. There we go to 118, something like that. But when I do that, you see that I get this little warning triangle here saying that I'm oversaturating my image. I need to compensate for this 116 by going negative on the green and blue. So I'll go minus 8 and minus 8. So my total still equals 100. So 118 minus 8 and minus 8. I'll then switch my channel to the green channel. And the green channel will then become the 116. And the red will be minus 8 oops, and minus 8. Then I'll switch my output channel to the blue channel. And this one will be 116 minus 8 and minus 8. So this, once I'm through, so I've done it for all three of the channels, red, green, and blue. If I turn it on and turn it off, and you look at the reds, and it's harder to see it on the projector than it is on your computer, so you guys can try this on your computer. It pushes the colors just a bit more in the reds and the blues. It makes the colors jump out. So that's, that's an option to get just a boost of color. It's subtle, but it can help. Let me go through some of the other ones. So we'll do this one. I'll go to Layer, New Adjustment Layer. This is going to be my channel mixer again. I'll call it Pop for clarity. And under the red output channel, we'll go 116, minus 8, and minus 8. 
I'll switch my output channel to green. Minus 8, 116, minus 8. Last one is blue. Minus 8, minus 8, and 116. And so if we look at this one, it's really hard to discern what the difference is. I don't even think you guys can see it. On my computer, I can see it. It changes the color of the reeds here just a little bit, and it changes the color of the blue sky just a little bit. So in this particular image, there's no reds. It's not going to do too much. So it, like I said, it varies depending on your image. But I want you to go through, and I want you to try it and see what happens. OK, so we've done pop. Oh, I should do that probably on this one, too. So let me go into layer, new adjustment layer. We're going to do a channel mixer. Start with the red channel, 16, minus 8, minus 8. Green, minus 8, 1, 16, minus 8, minus 8. There we go. And then blue, minus 8, minus 8, and 1, 16. And if we look at that one, it does push the colors, the reds. And it's hard. On the screen, it gets kind of washed out. If you look at it on an actual computer monitor, it's better. So that's pop. Last one that we're going to do is 1.5, which is the dodge and burn. And this one's actually set up differently than any of the rest of the ones that we've done. Dodge and burn is designed to mimic actual developing film in a dark room using chemicals. And we don't use chemicals anymore. Everything's digital. So this is the digital equivalent of using those chemicals to deliberately darken or lighten parts of the image. So what we're going to do this time for dodge and burn is we're going to go up, instead of going layer, new adjustment layer, we're actually just going to go to layer, new layer. So it's a regular layer that we're picking this time. And we'll call this layer dodge and burn. There we go. But we're going to change down here under mode. Instead of saying normal, we're going to use something called overlay. This is a blending mode, and we'll spend a lot of class next Monday talking about blending modes and what they do. But for right now, just trust me that it needs to be overlay. But we also have to check this box for fill with overlay neutral 50% gray. There it is. So we have dodge and burn, set to overlay, fill with 50% gray. And I'll go ahead and say OK. And you notice over here in my layer stack that this looks very different than the other layers that I've been creating today. And that's OK. We're going to work on this dodge and burn layer using two tools from our toolbar on the left here. They're both about 3 quarters of the way down. If you click and hold, one is like a little fist looking thing. And the other one is like a dot with a line on the end. <laughs> I don't know how to describe it any better than that. Uh, it'll say the dodge tool and the burn tool. So the dodge tool selectively lightens parts of the image. And the burn tool selectively darkens parts of an image. So I'll start with the burn tool. With the burn tool selected, I have my contextual ribbon up here at the top. And I have the ability to change the size. So right now, the size is just this circle. So if I were to start darkening, I can see that icon. for your dodge and burn, yeah. right underneath that. Click and hold on that one. Click and hold. Click and hold, and then pick the next one down. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. So I'm doing the burn right now. I'm darkening it. Okay. So if you can't find it, you're probably seeing just the dodge tool, this one here. Click and hold on it, and then you can pe press the burn tool instead. And so the burn tool allows us to darken parts of the image. And so the more that I click and the more that I do it, the more you can see that I can darken a particular part of the image. This is not exactly the most attractive example, but I'm trying to, to illustrate the point. The dodge tool, however, would lighten parts of the image. And so I could go back in and I could work on lightening up this part that I just worked on. But you see that it's pretty hard to make one of them go away. Okay? If if I did the dodge and burn directly on the image, instead of doing this layer, 
I would end up destroying the image in all likelihood. So that's why we do it on this special dodge and burn layer. So let me create another one. I'm going to turn this one off. I'm going to create another one and do a better job at it. Okay. So I'll turn that one off. I'm going to go to layer, new layer, and I'm going to call this dodge and burn two. It's going to be an overlay mode with 50% gray. And I'll go ahead and say, OK. And there's my dodge and burn two. So now maybe I can do a slightly better job. Let me get in here with my burn tool. And instead of limiting my brush to be just that circle, I want to make it a little bit bigger. You can make that bigger right here by clicking and just adjusting the size up using that little slider. My hardness should be set to 0. That's already correct. There are a bunch of other brushes that you don't need to worry about just yet. Why is the hardness set to 0? Because I want it to be diffuse. Oh. If the hardness was set to 100%, here. Let me switch back to my practice layer here. If I had my, I'm going to click in the same place. See how that gradiates out a little bit? I have a gradient. If my hardness on this brush was set at the opposite, at 100, and I did it, it'll make a perfectly precise circle. So unless I was trying to create a, a blue moon or something, I, I don't know that that's the right solution. So we're going to try to leave that hardness set to 0. And my size, I can adjust using that slider. The other option that I have with the size of my, um, sorry, turn it on with the size of my brush is to use the bracket keys on the keyboard. And so I typically use those to change my brush size. So if I push the, uh, the bracket up size, I can get that a little bit larger. It's a little bit quicker than adjusting it via the little slider. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to work the edges of this image just a bit. Give a little bit of a vignetting effect. Yeah, maybe about like that. And so I've just darkened up those edges a bit. Like that. You guys can try, try to play around with it. It's unlikely that you'll be able to go in, turn this one back on, and really do too much to say, say I wanted to darken the shadows in those trees, or excuse me, I wanted to lighten those shadows. I could come in with the dodge tool. We could zoom in a bit, you know, and I could try to lighten those up a bit. But it's not going to change that much. So it's not like you're suddenly going to make it look sunny, for example. So if I went Control-0 and we zoomed out, maybe it helped a little bit. I don't know how much it helped. So be aware that lightning doesn't always do as much as darkening was. So that's dodge and burn. So essentially, what we're going through today is black and white, levels, curves, pop, and dodge and burn. So if we do, say, if we save each of these, we'll end up with six images, six versions of this particular file. So let's start with that. So I had my original right here. So I've turned all of my layers off. With all of my layers off, I'm going to go to File, Save for Web. These, these computers are on uh, CS6. That's the version of Photoshop that they're running. If you have your own computer that has the Creative Cloud on it, which a lot of you subscribe to that and, and do that anyway, the Save for Web has gone away. That was something Adobe got rid of when they went to Creative Cloud. So you guys will just do a Save As, as opposed to Save for Web. On these computers, we're going to do a Save for Web. So I'll go ahead and click on Save for Web. Again, none of my layers are on. This is my original image. All right, it gives us a preview. If you wanted to see the whole um, image, you can press Control-0, and you can see the whole image. I'm going to change my file type here to be JPEG, and I want my preset to be listed as JPEG high. That's what I'm looking for. I'm sorry, how do you get the whole picture? Control-0. Oh, Control-0. Control zero. In, in all the Adobe products, Control-0 zooms to fit. So it's just the keyboard shortcut to zoom to fit. So I'm going to pick JPEG high, but because we're posting these on the course website, we don't need giant quality uh, images. 
So I'm going to change whatever the larger number is down here in image size to be 1,000. So in this case, my width is 3,264. I'm going to change the width to be 1,000, just because we don't need giant images. Okay. So I've set that width at 1,000. I'm at JPEG high. I'm going to click Save. So they, they, they crop it or they compress it? No, they just make the whole image smaller. They're just not going to crop anything. It's just taking, instead of being a, a bigger file, it's going to make it a little bit smaller. But you, you, didn't lose you, won't, any, you won't lose anything. It, what it does is it evenly picks pixels out. It just compresses and shrinks it down. Okay. Just scale it down kind of exactly. It's like scaling it down. Scaling. Okay. So I've set that 1,000. When I click Save, it's going to pop up this little Saved Optimized As dialog box. I'm going to choose to save it in my flash drive or on my OneDrive, if you're doing OneDrive. Uh, today is 104, and I need a new folder for the spring of 2018, if I can type. There we go. And I'm going to save this in here as my image, but I'm going to add and underscore original, so that I know that this was the original file that I'm saving. And I'll go ahead and click on Save. Then I'm going to come in and turn on the black and white adjustment. Now, I don't want to be specific about, we're going to save five additional versions of this file. You can turn one on, or you can leave them all on as you go through. So in this case, I'm just turning the black and white on. I'm going to say File, Save for Web. Control-0 shows the whole image. JPEG high, my larger image, my width here is going to be 1,000. I'll click Save. It's not going to be the original anymore. This is going to be the black and white, so BW for black and white. I'll click Save. I'll turn off my black and white and turn on my levels. And I'll say File, Save for Web. You get where I'm going, right? So we'll make sure that the width here is 1,000. It's a JPEG high. I'll click Save. And this one is going to be Levels. And I'll click Save. Then I'm going to turn on the curves. I'll say File, Save for Web. Thousand. And this one was curves. I click save. Now, if you found that, you know what, I really liked the curves in conjunction with the pop, for example, you can leave them both on. You don't have to turn the old one off. So if you want to do it cumulative where you just keep adding to it, that's OK too. So I'll leave both of these on this time, but I'm going to call it pop. I'll say file save for web, 1,000, save. And this one is going to be pop. Click Save. And the last one is the dodge and burn. And so I'll go File, Save for Web, 1,000. And this will be dodge burn. And I'll click Save. So I've ended up with six versions of this file. The original plus all the edits. So five more edits. So I get six files. You guys are going to repeat this for two additional images. So you're going to end up today with 18 total images that you've done. All of those 18, you're then going to post to the website. But I'm going to walk you through it because we're going to do it a little bit different than we've posted before. So. I'm going to go ahead and upload those images to the course website. Let me get to the course website here. I'm going to go to New, Post. Here's my new post. This is exercise Oops, 104. There we go. And this time, instead, and these directions, by the way, are on the back of your handout. So you can flip it over and do it on the back of your handout. I'm going to come down here under Categories and make sure that I check Exercise 104. 
There we go. So that's checked. Perfect. Uh, I've given it a title already. In this format box on the right side, instead of picking standard, which is what you've always done, I'm instead going to pick gallery. And the gallery is going to allow me to put a slideshow up rather than um, just a whole bunch of images. So I have that. It's set to gallery. Then I'm going to go to um, this gallery post format. I'm just seeing here. Uh, they, I made it, I made it, um, uh, right. Sorry, I'm just clarifying so that I follow the directions exactly how you guys are seeing it. Up here, there's a tab for gallery. When you pick, if you're not seeing it, you need to pick gallery and then this tab should show up. I'm going to click on gallery and then click on insert gallery or add images. Which I will do. There we go. Time to select the files. I'll click select files. I'm going to go to my flash drive or my OneDrive. Uh, let's see, today is 104. And it's my spring of 2018. There we go. I'm going to select all of these files at once. You guys will have 18. I only have uh, six. I'll select all of them at once. And I'm just dragging through them. Or I could select the first one, hold down Shift, and select the last one. Either way. Select them all. And I'll click on Open. Now this process is going to take a while. But it's going to upload one after the other. It'll get to 100%. It'll say crunching and then it'll move on and keep uploading. And when it's done, we'll see all of these here. I'll go ahead and click on Save All Changes at this point. OK, so now that's done, I can close this little checkbox. And I'm going to go to the content tab and I'm going to check this little slider for slideshow on post page. Perfect. I'll go ahead and I can't click publish yet because I need to come down here and set my featured image. So I'll come down, click on set featured image, so I still have to do that. And in this case I can pick any one, sorry, for me when I, um, because I'm an administrator I see everybody's stuff that they upload, not just mine. You guys just see yours. Um, so let me, uh, let me filter by what was just uploaded to this post. There we go. There's my images. I'm going to pick whatever I think is the best one. Let's say it's this one. And I'll set that one as my featured image. Perfect. Now I'll scroll all the way up. And I can click on the Publish tab. Perfect. If I navigate over to the gallery tab, I should see all of the images here. That's good. I'll go back to content. Let's go ahead and view the post to make sure. There it is. And so instead of having a bunch of images listed, I get this little slideshow where I can scroll through and see all of my images. It's just a little cleaner for when you post them. If you have trouble with the post, I can help you through getting it set up. Sometimes it doesn't work perfectly. Uh, it's not the best system in the world, but I'd rather have this uh, slideshow than a bunch of images. Oh, when you do a slideshow, it wouldn't show this file name, so you know what is it? It doesn't what matter. I don't, I don't, I'm not overly worried about that. Okay. You, if you get to the point where you have 18 images, you've done everything that I asked you to do. Okay. All right? So I'm going to turn you guys loose to work on this. I'll float around and I'll help you guys if you have trouble with any of these steps. But again, at this point, repetition is a good thing. So doing this multiple times and playing around with it on different images is really going to help you guys learn it. OK? Come out. Yes. 18 images in one post today. 